All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, if you want to continue getting more great critical care content such as this video. Now, in this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at one of our miscellaneous antiarrhythmic medications, one that's widely known for its use in our bradycardia ACLS algorithm, and that medication is atropine. Now, atropine is a very interesting medication, not only in how it works, but in the ways in which it can be used. It is probably most notable for its treatment of bradycardia and its integral role in the ACLS algorithm, but it's actually used for many other purposes as well. So we're going to start off talking about how it is that atropine works. Now, atropine is actually classified as an anticholinergic or a parasympathetic or can also be considered something that we call an anti-muscarinic medication. Now, in order to really understand what this means, I do want to do a quick review of both our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is going to be the responses of the fight or flight. Now, this is primarily driven by norepinephrine's activation of both alpha and beta receptors. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system, that this is that rest and digest response. And this is going to be driven by acetylcholine's activation of muscarinic receptors. Put simply, we can think of the sympathetic as ramping us up and the parasympathetic as bringing us back down. A really good example of this is sympathetic activation of the heart is going to increase our heart rate versus parasympathetic activation is going to decrease our heart rate. Now, the way atropine works is it actually antagonizes the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. And what this means is it reversibly binds to those receptors so that they're unavailable for acetylcholine to actually activate it. And so by doing this, it actually prevents the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's this blockage of activation that gives us its uses, which I am going to discuss here shortly. All right, so now let's move on and talk about some of the side effects of atropine. Some potential side effects that your patient may experience can be things like dry mouth, blurred vision, sensitivity to light, headache, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, and tachycardia. Some potentially serious adverse effects that we can see with this by system are going to be neurologically we can see hallucinations, delirium, and seizures. For our cardiovascular, we can actually see reflex bradycardia sometimes, tachycardia, uh, arrhythmias such as SVT, VT, and even VFib. And then finally, on the metabolic side, hypoglycemia and hypokalemia are also potential adverse effects. Now, as far as our routes of administration and concentration, so we can actually give atropine either IV, IM, subcutaneous, as well as we can, we can give it to our patients via inhalation, oral, and ophthalmic in some cases. Now, the most common concentration that we're going to see is going to be in our preloaded syringe, which has 1 milligram in 10 mLs, giving us a concentration of 0.1 milligrams per mL. Now, other common concentrations are multidose vials and ampules that have uh, 0.4 or 0.6 milligrams per mL, but you can actually go even higher on these. And then for ophthalmic purposes, it's a percentage-based solution that's used, um, but I'm actually not going to cover those here in this lesson. So now let's actually talk about the different uses that we have for atropine within critical care. And there's really three primary uses for it. The first one is going to be our symptomatic bradycardia. And for this, atropine is going to be our first line choice for our ACLS algorithm here. The way atropine works here is by blocking the parasympathetic activation of the vagus nerve and its effects on the SA and AV nodes. By decreasing this activation, this is going to lead to more rapid firing of both of the nodes, as well as decreased conduction time at that AV junction, leading to increased heart rate. Now, it's important to know, though, that patients with third-degree heart blocks are not going to benefit as there is no propagation of that signal from the AV node to the ventricles. As well as patients who have second-degree type 2, think Mobitz 2 here, the effectiveness of atropine is going to be significantly reduced. Also, patients who have received heart transplants will not benefit due to the denerviation of the vagus nerve in that transplant. Now here for symptomatic bradycardia, the dose is going to be 1 milligram IV push, and we can repeat this every 3 to 5 minutes for a maximum dose of 3 milligrams. 
Now, another potential benefit of atropine is going to be in our secretion management. And we can think of parasympathetic activation is actually going to lead to increased secretion production, thus blocking this can help to decrease these secretions. Now, while its use for this is really not common because typically we're going to try something like glycopyrrolate first, um, this can be a, an effective alternative though for that secretion management, uh, especially in those end-of-life patients. And then typically here, the dose that we're looking at using is 0.5 to 1 milligram, uh, and we can repeat this every one to two hours for those patients. You can also potentially use the ophthalmic solution and administer that orally for this purpose as well. Now, the next major potential use that I want to talk about is to really counter the effects of reversing paralytics. Now, while this is not necessarily common in the ICU and more often used in the OR, this is something to be aware of and you certainly could potentially see this. So sort of the backstory on this is in order to reverse the effects of a paralytic, an anticholinesterase inhibitor is used, uh, such as a medication called neostigmine, which is something that we call an organophosphate. Now, this acetylcholine esterase inhibitor is actually going to increase the availability of acetylcholine and thus increase binding with those muscarinic receptors and thus an increased parasympathetic activation. Obviously, this can lead to extremely low heart rates and significant secretion production. And so to combat this, atropine is one of a couple potential medications that's given together with neostigmine. Now, our typical dose when we're using it here is 1.2 milligrams IV push. So those are pretty much the three big potential uses in critical care. There is one last use that you could potentially see in some situations. It's definitely nothing I've ever seen, um, but depending where you work, that this might be something that you come across, and that's when we're dealing with organophosphate poisoning. I do also think this is a very interesting use of this, so I did want to mention it here. Now, most commonly in the case of poisoning, uh, organophosphates are actually used in some insecticides, um, but it's also interesting to know that they are the key component in nerve agent chemical weapons. Now, just like I talked about with neostigmine and reversing paralytics, organophosphates work by inactivating acetylcholinesterase. And thus here, atropine is used to counter the effects of this increased acetylcholine. Now, dosing for atropine here can actually be done in the field IM via an auto-injector, which is usually a 2 milligram uh, per injection with up to three of them given based on the patient's symptoms. And then within the hospital, our treatment is usually going to be 2 to 5 milligrams IV, and then doubling that dose every 3 to 5 minutes until those symptoms subside. Now, for really severe cases, and this is potentially where, depending where you work, you could maybe come across this, that hundreds of milligrams of atropine can actually be given over the course of a couple days. All right, so that was our quick review of atropine. I hope you guys enjoyed this lesson. If you did, please leave me a like down below as well as leave me a comment and let me know what you thought of this lesson. If you haven't subscribed already, make sure and do so as well as share this lesson with other people that you think might find it useful as well. A special thank you to our YouTube and Patreon members out there. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in joining, you can join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to Patreon and check out some of the additional perks you get for doing just that. Make sure and stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, check out a couple really awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.